Hi, um, thank you very much for the presentation. My name is Raman, I'm from Belarus. So before the presentation, I exchanged a few words with uh, Korhan, the discussant, and um, I asked, what are you gonna talk about? And he said, negative comments. So I, I said, okay, that's interesting because I know comments from the positive view. Um, and a few minutes later, I thought, wait a second, like we already have negative externalities. Why would you, ha why would you need another concept for that? And thank you, Aulia, for putting this on the slide. It made, me, made it very hopefully clear for me. So if I understand it correctly, negative externalities are the ruined ruins and the negative comments are the ruinous ruins. Is that correct? That, that could be framed this way, but the, the idea with negative externalities exactly. is that uh, there are consequences and not requirements. Um, that's part of the beginning, but I didn't explain why at the time I did the distinction. Um, and um, the, the idea is that they are not politicized, the negative externalities. Uh, the, 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 the answer to negative externalities can be to uh, pay the people who suffer damage, or sometimes to have the people who suffer damage uh, not say anything because if they sue, for example, a company that might have a negative impact on the economy and that will be bad, and some uh, proponents have been uh, explaining that you should favor the company over the people who um, suffer these uh, damages. But at no point the question is asked about what is causing these uh, damages and how can we deal politically with this situation, maybe to stop the damage from happening. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not the point. Uh, the point is to avoid or limit these consequences but never to question why these activities are producing these uh, consequences which are lasting consequences because whether or not there is someone to suffer the damage well actually there, there, there are some damages so it sometimes happened that there is a human agent suffering the damage so that will be acknowledged but if it was only nature uh, will even the negative externalities always be acknowledged probably not so it's rather a way to repoliticize the situation um, and to understand that these consequences are not just there, you know, uh, as we say in, in French, like it's by chance and uh, there is a good reason and to do some politics about this reason and maybe to question the reason why there are these externalities. So it's, it's in order not to treat negative externalities has negative externalities, not to depoliticize these uh, negative externalities that I also introduced this, um, this notion. As Marx said, um, and I'm in the book we've published, I mentioned him, he has this quote in uh, The Holy Family, very funny book by the way, uh, you should read it if you haven't. Um, it's really very funny, it's al almost trolling Marx wrote this book. Um, it's, uh, he says that one should not be surprised by the consequences of what is happening, the consequences of the uh, 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 society. Uh, and it basically says what I said, is that there are not consequences, there are conditions. Um, but of course it's harder to criticize conditions, requirements than consequences. You can always hope to make the consequences disappear but they will not. So we have to address them in a different way. And that's why the framework I put forward with uh, uh, negative comments might be useful, hopefully. Just, uh, if, we, if you don't mind, I, I would like to, to give the mic to the people raising questions, and if, it, if it's possible, uh, you answer later. Yeah. Or if you prefer this way, we can also proceed this way, as you wish. This was a technical question. Just tell me what you prefer. The question was, yeah, it wasn't a question, Danny. It, yeah. it was an introduction to the but question. Exactly. Thank you for the clarification. So <laughs> the question is, negative externalities, they can be fixed in the current capitalist uh, system uh, by putting taxes or by, uh, I don't know, introducing some limitations. And uh, as I understand it, negative comments, they cannot be fixed without dismantling the capitalist society. 
is that so? Because, uh, you know, whatever seminar that we have, usually it ends up with the bottom line, capitalism is the greatest evil, and without dismantling capitalism, we cannot have a sustainable way of living. So from your point of view as a philosopher, is this the bottom line here? That's the question. Thank you. Uh, well, well, no, it's not. It's not because uh, as uh, uh, Chakrabarti, whom I've been mentioning, so the very famous Indian historian says, if you only have a problem of capitalism, uh, your situation is pretty good compared to the Anthropocene. So imagine like a world revolution, like the one advocated by a uh, researcher and activist, Andreas Malm, was to happen. What will the people who were behind this world revolution and anti-capitalist revolution will do to deal with uh, destroyed and polluted soils, uh, nuclear waste, uh, and lots of these negative comments I've been uh, identifying, but there are lots more. It's not my job to identify them. It's rather to propose a framework which makes it possible to collect it of people to identify those. Uh, well, no, these issues will not be solved. Uh, and, and also you should not, uh, you should not make your measures or your action depend on the abolition of capitalism because you're not going to see the abolition of capitalism soon. And so if you, if you have to wait for that to happen, to be able to fight against the ongoing and future crisis, well, you're kind of doomed. So we have to find ways of dealing with that without waiting for the end of capitalism to happen. That doesn't mean that the forms it will take are capitalistic, but that means that we have to begin acting under capitalism. So, um, um, and, and, you know, there are situations where the um, capitalistic reality is suspended, whether at a global scale or a local scale. Uh, I myself, and I will be quick with that because um, I'm very interested in the work of uh, Otto Neurath, who was the kind of rival to uh, Friedrich Hayek in uh, Vienna uh, in the uh, 20th century and um, a proponent of the Red Vienna. And he studied three cases of capital suspension of capitalism, uh, the war in Yugoslavia before the First World War, uh, the end of the, of the First World War when the um, uh, Austrian Empire was dismantled, and the Second World War, when it was a planned economy and no longer a capitalistic economy. So it, it does actually happen that uh, we escape, uh, here was globally, but maybe more locally, the, the realm of uh, capitalism. So we have to act right now with the means at our disposal and not wait for this huge change to happen, or even not to you know, uh, say, I will only act once capitalism is dismantled. Which is quite easy, actually, to say that. Just one quick follow-up question. I know. No, no, no. You, you will have a... <laughs> the next one. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, here we share also the questions, so we share the, the time. Yeah. So, don't forget to introduce yourself. Okay. Thank you, uh, Federico from Colombia. And this question, which doesn't have an answer, probably, and it's connected to what you just said at the end, is that with, we, we talk about, for example, circular economy, or your proposal about the technological of zombie technologies, etc., which are really technical things, if you think about it, more of modes of production, almost. And on, also what the example of the cities of the future you just put is, is, is a technical thing. And if you think degrowth, at some point, it's also a technical thing. And even if we improve a lot on these, on these concepts, we think that by having these concepts, they're going to become realities. As if the market, we, we still think as if the market itself will provide them. And I, I would like to ask, like, what kind of institutions with the big E, not a, a, a ministry or something, but what kind of institutions that regulate power will need to be changed in order to 
put into reality these kinds of new modes of production. Because I, I, I have the feeling that the actual way of institutions work and the relations of power and also the laws uh, are contradictory to these things at some point, at least to make it massive. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, this goes back to what I've been mentioning about the level of action. Uh, whether it's macro, the big institution, or uh, meso, uh, in between uh, micro and macro. Uh, it is true that um, we, so it's not just concepts or talk, because as I said, we're working with uh, territories, collectivities, uh, companies, even companies in, um, North America, um, which is not a Soviet you know, territory. Um, and so it's, 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 it's real. But yeah, the, the question is how to scale. At this point, I don't have the answer to that. How to scale, how to go against uh, the neoliberal mode of governance of the big institutions, uh, the world institutions. Um, but the, the, the issue is rather to show how things, not locally, uh, it's not just local, you know, we're not talking about small communities, we're sometimes talking about uh, big companies we're working with, uh, big territories and the likes. But how these territories have to bifurcate, have to take a different direction because the current paradigm will not work uh, uh, for a, long, uh, a lot of time. And these actors are more and more sensible to this. And the question is, once you're not you know, opposing your, to the, these big institutions by saying, OK, we disagree with you, we're radicals, uh, what you're doing is bad, so listen to us, that will not work. But you say, OK, even these actors who are capitalistic actors can no longer function under the current model. They have to bifurcate. They have to take a different direction. Then that will wait much more than the previous situation. And once you make... Uh, something that was unthinkable previously possible, well, there is a viral effect, sorry for the metaphor, that may happen after that. Uh, uh, a kind of recipe is available for other people to use it and reuse it and implement it in very different contexts. So the question is to scale at this meso level, but of course that doesn't um, provide a solution to all the questions that you've been mentioning, but that is what we are doing currently because we think that the level at which uh, our actions may happen are actually happening and may have some weight, but there's still work to be, to be done, of course. So I fully agree with that. Hello. Thank you. Uh, I'm Marco from France. Uh, thank you for your talk. I have a more uh, theoretical question, maybe, uh, but it's related to scale and institutions, as you just mentioned. I was wondering whether the, um, the use of the term commons was the most appropriate. Maybe it's a choice, but I feel like when you're talking about the commons, you're more talking about, a, let's say, a negative public good than a common, even if you're, um, so you're emphasizing on institutions, but more on how are we going to manage these, uh, these, uh, these realities, but you were talking about different types like nuclear waste, the bacteria, the technologies, and they are more at the macro or even global level. Like we are not going to deal with nuclear waste at the communal level. And the idea of the common would be more that there is something that is shared and then is managed by a community. So is it a, is it a, um, conscious change, kind of, um, the, the term to emphasize institutions, or, yeah, this is my question. <laughs> well, thank you for this, for this question. It's a, it's a conscious use of this term. What I will, my first, first part of the answer will be, there is the same problem with the commons. If air, water, and the like are commons, for which community? Um, Sorry. That is, not always, um, that is not always obvious. There is, for example, the problem of the um, forest in Brazil, where some, uh, uh, just finish, and, uh, the, 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 the forest in, in, in Brazil, where some uh, uh, people say, well, 
uh, that's a commons for the whole of humanity and other will say no that's the population have to deal with it the question is it's always difficult to know exactly at uh, what which level the community uh, uh, stops and and is no longer relevant so there is this problem of scale with um, uh, the traditional let's say uh, commons uh, all the points you were making um, it's, it's, uh, it's of course relevant but since in my understanding nothing is intrinsically a commons you have to have a community that is identifying something has a positive or has a negative commons um, acknowledging a reality maybe has a negative commons well uh, you need to have inquiries, and what I call inquiries into valuation, deciding that something is eventually a negative commons for some reasons and have to be dealt with. Well, it means you have the community. This community will not always be, um, how should I say, have the full authority to enforce some measures, but you can still deal with the issue at some level, maybe some local level, maybe some macro level, I don't know, uh, that depends on the situation, but still it will be able to wait in this uh, uh, debate. What is the community that is uh, concerned by 5G, for example? That is not very an obvious um, answer. Um, but still, there are collectives that are tackling this issue about um, uh, uh, um, technological democracy and, and, and the likes. So they are still trying to do the job about that. It doesn't mean they have a uh, <laughs> they're fully representative of the entire population concerned by 5G, the 5G debate, but it still means that they're doing this work of valuation and trying to um, acknowledge this uh, technology has a negative comments. So that's, that's the way I would um, understand it. So yeah, the situation is not perfect, but uh, it's not perfect either with the traditional comments. Okay, so let's start the second and last wave. And I know you have a question, and uh, but others will have priority, especially girls, if it's possible to have also girls. If it's not possible, so be it. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you for the talk. My question links. No, before that, you need to introduce yourself. My name is Mats Hansen. I'm from Germany, uh, studying Epoch B. Uh, macroeconomics, mainly. Yeah. Enough? Yeah, that's enough. Okay. Your name and your... Yeah. <laughs> um, Simple information. So many of the goods that we are producing and consuming nowadays, um, some would call them cultural consumption, um, because we are not... Like, we could also access the services from your phone with, a, with an old phone, yep. maybe. Um, so how, my question regards how to organize and start the cultural change necessary um, to uh, reduce this cultural consumption more to a more sustainable way of consuming without relying on classist arguments and giving a mor moral bonus to the m more sustainable people. So to say it differently, how to make people want to live in a repurposed offices without making uh, this fashion and prone to overconsumption on the other hand. So, they could then say, I'm living in this refurbished house so I can travel a lot. Um, and do you have any ideas uh, on the design of a cultural feedback system that would be necessary for such a change? I, I, I don't currently have it. It's something I'm interested in um, over this uh, debate around what I've been calling uh, intensive sufficiency, uh, how to make this kind of degrowth aspect desirable. You're absolutely right that uh, one of the problem is a possible gentrification of what is happening, um, and that should be uh, uh, avoided at all uh, at all costs. Um, I, I I don't have some precise answer to that. I, I do identify it as a priority now um, for the future. I think these um, contradictions have been mentioning. At the, uh, during the talk when I was answering some of the questions um, might be interesting to tackle this, this question because when you want to have people renounce something it's not always a sacrifice uh, it should also be seen as renouncing a certain way of being 
um, expropriated from your work or being exploited and the likes. And sometimes um, renunciation, stopping something, uh, renouncing a technology, uh, it's not always seen in a bad way, under a bad light. Uh, it's not also something that can be desirable for lots of populations. And I, I think we should uh, put that forward. Uh, what will be tough will be actually the how do we deal with rich people? Poor people are already sober, frugal, but rich people absolutely not. Uh, and so the question is, how do we deal with these fundamental inequalities? Because if we want to embrace a sober scenario for the future, those that will pay the higher price will be actually uh, rich people. Uh, people who take the plane, people who have habits which are absolutely not compatible with what will be expected. Uh, so that is a tough question because under these scenarios we should go back to the living conditions of the 50s or 60s, something like that, which is not the Middle Ages, right? It's, it's, uh, but with current technologies, of course. It's, it's uh, 15 and 60s with current technologies, more efficient ones. Um, but yeah, that would be more difficult for some people than, than others. And that is a tricky political question. But it, because if we maintain these inequalities and the price to pay that frugal people have to be even more frugal, well, that's a recipe for a civil war. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, my name is Valentin, I'm from Austria, and I don't really understand why we have to put genders on our questions, but this is another point. Um, I wanted to inquire a little about your underlying ideology because I have some uh, like misconceptions maybe, um, especially the way how you talk about capitalism. About, uh, sorry? Especially the way, the way how you talk about capitalism. So, uh, for me, the, from the way I understood it, like it nearly feels a little like for you, it's something we turned on and we're going to turn off again at one point. I'm going to explain a little what I believe about it, and then maybe you can like clarify what you mean. Mm. Because for me, like capitalism is more something that when we were able to formalize social relations a little more, we could bundle up like uh, like barter relations to markets to get a new mode of operation, then we started building institutions like companies that were able to interact more with this. Now we're able to build new institutions like commons, for example, which you also use, which are still working under the mode of operation of like a market operation, but we're, which are not completely in line anymore. So what I see is like that we are realigning what do we define as, as value. Like right now we have a big problem because we take money as value and like maybe we should like look at, look at other things also. So if you say we shouldn't focus on destroying capitalism and then do something, do you mean by that that we should try to organize our solutions in an institutional setting under a market ideology and try to st streamline the solutions in this setting? Or what do you mean exactly by don't go out of it, that, mm, but like stay within? What I, what I do mean is, uh, so just about the first point, uh, I don't think capitalism is something you, uh, like a button you push on and off, right? I was just mentioning the proposal of Andreas Mann has a counter example because he is uh, saying that we could imagine a world revolution that will uh, 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 stop capitalism. I, I don't think this, I think this is science fiction right now. Right, so I don't think this is a good premise for action uh, because it means you will never act because the premise will never be fulfilled. Um, the second point is, mm, I would say, um, yeah, so basically that's, that's, that's it. I, I, will, I will make a difference between market and, and capitalism. Uh, uh, I think in a non-capitalist society you can still have markets that operate in a different way and will uh, look at the, the work, for example, have, of uh, economic sociologists like uh, people like Michel Callon, um, uh, who are talking about real markets. Not necessarily the market has a concept of the economy right now, but real markets has they operate, and I think they have been operating in very different societies in history, and not just capitalistic societies. So I will leave uh, markets uh, aside. So no, my my point is rather that uh, it's more simple than that. Uh, it's rather than we should um, look at the, the world as it is right now. It's not just about markets, it's not just about capitalism, it's also uh, a world which is 
lots of time forgotten by economists. It's also a, a, a world of organizations, companies. That's normal because that's not the same people who deal with organizations, that people in management science, uh, um, different kind of population. Uh, we also li live in a world of organizations. And these organizations right now, whether we are under capitalism or not, for a lot of them, they won't be able to go on with their activities for physical reasons, for legal reasons, because the legal framework is changing for various reasons. And the, question, the, 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 the problem is, well, it's not necessarily a problem, but they don't know how to deal with this situation. And there are lots of opportunities to help them redirect what they are doing. And this redirection at their level may go counter to the expectations of current uh, capitalism. And what might we build from that, from having these companies take different directions, seize their activities and the likes? That remains to be seen. But instead of suspending capitalism, I think that's a better departure point for action. Okay, okay and the quick follow-up question on the uh, discussion that we had about capitalism. Sorry? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, and thank you, Valentin, for picking up again the discussion. Um, yeah, you said that uh, capitalism is not going away anytime soon, right? I, I completely agree with this idea. Um, so, as I see it, it's uh, because this is the way things are, probably it's better to find a way to adapt to the current system rather than to fight it. I'm not saying that we should not do anything at all, but we should find a way to tweak it, change it somehow, but it's not going away unless there is a global revolution, which is very unlikely. So my follow-up question was, do you think that the missing element um, would be the more active regulatory role of the state under the current capitalism, would this be enough to, uh, to have this sustainable way of living? Well, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I wouldn't go as far as you did by saying we should adapt to the uh, system because I still believe it's not going in the right direction and that is still a problem. But what I see, as I've been alluding to, to it in my presentation, but if I take the example of sobriety, we're still living under capitalism, but at the same time you have a lot of what Ulrich Beck, the German sociologist, called infra-political bodies. So not elected bodies, but bodies who are pro which are producing expertise. Uh, they, are, they are conceiving these scenarios uh, where it's not said in an overt way, but where you, you, you find the consequences of the adoption of sobriety. Uh, if you can read those scenarios the right way. You, you, you find some uh, direction that is put forward that is not necessarily compatible, or at least I don't know how, with um, capitalism as we, as we know it and with the expectations of the economy as we know it right now. So what will happen? Who will enforce these measures? And I think a lot of people uh, in the state and elsewhere do not know how they will deal with that uh, situation. One possible answer is indeed a state answer, uh, an authoritarian answer, um, which would not necessarily be uh, very good. And so the issue is to anticipate these possible answers and to provide um, alternative answers which are not totally utopian in the bad sense of utopia, meaning they have no grounding, right? Uh, they are not, not uh, unlike uh, concrete utopias of uh, uh, German philosopher Ernst Bloch. Um, so, yeah, th th there are some seeds of um, uh, different ways of operating for the future. Um, and instead of a kind of authoritarian, eco-fascist way of dealing with these situations. I think it's well worth uh, working on different the emergence of different institutions, different scenarios, um, different ways of 
um, operating that we do not know, we do not yet know about, we do not yet implement, we do not yet work on, but that will have to emerge uh, in this uh, uh, coming situation. So um, it's not a no, it's not a yes, it's um, part of it, yeah, you're right, but hopefully it's not just a state authority. And, 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 and I would say also the state is not powerless, but uh, there are a lot of questions to which it doesn't have the answer. And there are also lots of questions to which the market doesn't have the answer. So what do we do in this situation? <laughs>